I do love coffee. Maybe we can actually do this now. Oh my god, I have a lot of Cecilia, you're breaking my heart. You're shaking my confidence, stealing. Oh, Cecilia, I'm down on my knees. I'm begging you, please, to come home. So come home. Hello everyone, it's Cecilia Joy and welcome back to my account. To my account, I can't do it anymore. Hello everyone, it's Cecilia Joy and welcome back to my channel. So today I have a very exciting video for you that I have attempted the intro for about 50 times but this is the one. This weekend I was involved in a very exciting project to be called This weekend, I was involved in a very exciting project called Behind the Scars, run by a photographer called Sophie Mayan. The account is completely dedicated to showing off scars and the stories and people behind them. She is an amazing photographer and she takes the most amazing and beautiful pictures of people bearing their scars um, in the hope to tell the story behind them and I think break down a little bit of taboo that surrounds the whole subject of scarring and imperfection and things like that. Last year I was lucky enough to go on a photo shoot with Sophie where she took pictures of my scars with the intention to put them on her Instagram account. This was a very exciting thing for me because I think the project is amazing and I think it spreads such an important message and awareness not only of scars in general but of so many conditions and surgeries and things that people have. I was very excited to be involved. This weekend my pictures were finally posted. I was very nervous. It's the first time that I've ever taken part in anything like this. For the pictures, I did have a bra on, but it was mostly just my scar upwards from here from my heart transplant, and then also the scar tissue below my bra um, from the ECMO machine, which is a form of life support that I was on, and various other chest strains and things that I've had. I do have other scars around my body, but the main focus was on my chest scars. So as I said, my pictures were posted this weekend, but not only this, but Sophie was kind enough to give me reins of the whole Instagram account for the whole weekend. So she gave me the password and she just said, have fun with it, you know, engage with people, talk to people, and you know, tell them the story behind your scars. So that's exactly what I did. I had the best weekend. It was so fun, despite me being quite nervous, because I felt it was a bit of a responsibility to take over an account that has over 56,000 followers but everybody was just lovely and I got the nicest and most lovely responses to my pictures and to the stories that I posted and everybody was so inquisitive and asked so many questions and was so interested and so lovely that I thought I could perhaps make a video answering some of the questions that people had for me. I put a message out on the story and I said if anyone has any questions they'd like me to answer in a video, I would be happy to do so, just pop them below. And to my surprise, I actually got so many questions I wasn't expecting to at all. Um, so yeah, I'm going to answer some of those questions today. There are so many, so I am going to have to pick and choose, otherwise this video would be about an hour long and no one wants that. I have questions on my phone, I'm just going to go through, pick some and answer some. And yes, yeah, so I hope you enjoy finding a little bit more about my scars and what's behind them. So the first question that I received is from Jessica Staplehurst underscore 13 and she said, what is the biggest adjustment that you've had to make? So I think that's a really good question. Anybody with chronic illness or life-threatening illness will know that their whole life is basically just one big massive adjustment. Before I became very ill when I was 10, 
I didn't really go to the hospital that often. It was something I did sort of every six months. It wasn't a big thing for me. I didn't take many medications or anything like that. But ever since I was in hospital for that eight months, so after my heart surgery and when I had my heart transplant, I think I've had to adjust to, not so much anymore actually, but I had to adjust to a life of hospitals and medications and being poked and prodded and I think I had to adjust to constantly receiving bad news at a time because it's true every time I'd go to the hospital it felt like there was a knock back I'd have a new diagnosis or something wasn't getting better or I needed to start a new medication something like that so I'm so much better now and I don't really have to deal with that anymore but Back in the day, you know, when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, it was just a cycle of kind of bad news. And I think I had to get adjusted to that. And of course, it was just such a relief when finally everything started to turn around. And I guess for me, I've actually had to adjust back to normal life again, adjust back to being just a 21 year old girl going through uni and looking for a job and you know that's something that everyone does and it, it, I think I've had to adjust to that you know just being normal. I'm not sure how to pronounce this but Trobertfi? Trobertfi. Trobertfi says thanks for sharing how often do you need to have checkups for your transplant and for your cancer? For my transplant Oh, I'm not gonna be able to answer this because I don't even know. They just give me my appointment and I go. My heart is supposed to be around every four months. I haven't had one in ages. It's due and I'm going to. My kidney is about every six months now. And in terms of cancer, I have to have six monthly, no, yearly CT scans. Um, full body CTs to make sure that my tumours are stagnant and they are not growing and then ultrasounds as well they've started ultrasounding there was one specific area just below my rib where a tumour caused quite a lot of damage and I had a lot of pain which I have spoken about in previous videos so I have ultrasounds there which are more common I think they're about six monthly you know if that's all wrong, I'll put it here. My mum knows, I know I'm 21, but you know, you all need your mum sometimes just to be there for you. And she does deal with a lot of the appointments, you know, which is so bad to admit, but, but I'm not entirely sure how often they are, but they're not that often anymore. I mean, at one point I was going into the hospital every single day for blood tests. So definitely a big change. Oh my gosh, where do they go? Where are the questions? Oh, this is a good question. B underscore sting underscore ZZZ asked, I'd like to hear how your parents coped. So that is a really good question because I think when people hear my story and hear that I've been really ill for a long time, they maybe don't tend to consider that I wasn't the only person affected by that. And that goes for every time a person has something go wrong in their life it's not just them affected it's all the people around them and I think to be honest it was harder for my parents because they were the ones who had to sit by my bedside every day my parents are the two strongest people I know um, they're amazing they have supported each other so much throughout everything they have supported me endlessly and I think I did say this a lot yesterday when people were asking me, but I think one of the massive things that has brought my parents and the whole family through this is our ability to joke about literally anything. It sounds really weird, but I was in bed in PICU and my parents would be making jokes. Jokes with the nurses, vice versa. You know, I would make jokes as much as I could. And I think from an outside perspective that might seem really strange but I know that anybody who's been through a similar thing will know that humour is such a saviour and for my parents and for my family that's what it was it was just seeing the maybe not seeing the bright side of everything but seeing the funny side of everything I mean 
even I was the same, like I, I hated it when my parents were upset for me or when they were worried about me. So my go-to was to make jokes, to make them laugh. So I remember when I was in Turkey and I was diagnosed with my brain tumour, um, a Turkish doctor literally walked in to the room. My dad had gone to find a sandwich or something, I don't really know what he was doing, like on the hunt for food as usual. And my mum was sat by me and he basically walked in, no warning, and said, yeah, you've got a brain tumour, we're going to have to operate, and then walked out again. And my mum was about to faint and I was just like... And so the first thing that came to my head was to make a joke about the fact that um, it meant that I didn't have to do my holiday reading anymore from school, which was to read Jane Eyre and I just absolutely was not having it and I hated it. So I was like, yes, I finally found a reason to not read Jane Eyre. And, you know, it broke the tension. It sort of brought my mum back down to earth. And, you know, we had a bit of a chuckle about it, as sick as it seems. But I think that's a really big thing that's helped us. The next question by Fluffy Cave was what helped you get through everything? And again, I just say what I said for my last answer, and that's the ability to laugh and be positive, even in the darkest of times. It's dot anna dot underscore says is it hard to tell your story over and over again to people that you meet this is also a good question i think it's not i don't mind telling my story but then again my story is really long and it it is a bit of a you know like when somebody asks me it can't just be like a really short answer i have to sort of tell a lot of the story to give context which is probably why if you're watching my videos for the first time you're probably wondering what the hell is wrong with her um a lot so it is hard to tell people constantly but then again I also really don't mind telling people because people are obviously going to be inquisitive about it I mean I would if I met someone else in the same position so I don't really mind and I don't find it too hard. A lot of people have asked me questions about whether I'm conscious of my scars, whether people stare at me, um, how I got more comfortable with them and about my self-confidence in general and I think for me my scars have... Hello? Hello? I can hear your wardrobing. Sorry. Yes, you should be. I'm, I'm going out in a minute, okay? Where are you going? I'm going to Cheer. I'm coming. We, you're, you're in the middle of filming. Oh, you, two o'clock. I did say to you, we're going out at two. It's now ten past two. So I did warn you. Just get your shoes. Will it still can... be light outside when we get back? Yes, we're only going for an hour or two. Okay, I'll have to finish it when we get back. Do you have to be so sassy? Get your shoes on, get your splints on, get your ass downstairs. <gasps> Well, I'll be back later. Hello. So I took a brief hiatus to go out with my mother. <laughs> but I'm back and I'm just going to continue the video from here. We were talking about body confidence. And as I said, many people have asked me how I've come to love my scars and how I'm confident. For me, my scars have sort of been something that I've grown up with since I was 10. From that point I had so many all over that it wasn't something that bothered me that much, it was sort of just something that I had. I guess it didn't really bother me that much, I think at the time my focus was so much on being alive and just trying to overcome all the illnesses and everything that I had that I wasn't really thinking about the scars that they were causing. And then when I got older as a 16 year old and you know 14, 15, 16 year old I guess I did started to care more especially when it came to like boys and what are they going to think of me when they find out that I have all these scars and that my feet are different to everybody else's and that was hard because I felt very different I was much more self-conscious but I feel like as I grew to like 17, 18, 19, I just stopped caring. I mean, my scars now are something that I'm really proud of. And as opposed to hiding them away, I actually like to wear things where people can see my scars because I'm proud of them. If somebody asks, 
you know, what, why have you got that scar? I'm happy to answer them. And I think that's the, th and I think that's another thing. People are always afraid to ask, but a lot of the time we would just prefer if you asked and we would be happy to answer rather than staring from a distance and wondering. In terms of my confidence, I haven't got, you know, 10 out of 10 confidence, but I don't think it's my scars that cause that. I think it's other things like general gripes that people have with their body, you know. In terms of how I overcame all of that worry about my scars, I think it was just sort of like a natural process. And as I began to realise that actually scars are something that you should show off as opposed to hide, because they're cool, like, not everyone has scars and not everyone has, you know, a story to tell behind them. So, you know, <sighs> okay, I was having some camera troubles. Oh, this video is never going to get filmed. Anyway, so yes, that's my answer to that question. This is a good question. So mini underscore asks what's something good you've never had you never would have experienced if it hadn't been for your illnesses there is so much that i would not have experienced if it was not for my illnesses and i'm very lucky that despite all of you know the heartbreak and the pain that it's caused me and my family it's also caused us a lot of joy through the things that we've got to do because of it. So I've met countless celebrities through charities and charity events, um, particularly through the charity called Rays of Sunshine. They are an amazing charity who grant wishes for seriously ill children. I will put their link below if you want to go and check them out. I have won a Pride of Britain award, if you didn't know that. Um, and that came about through shaving my head when I had my brain tumour, my spinal tumours. So that's another thing that's just probably one of the highlights of my life so far and probably will be forever. I've got to speak at numerous events which has been so exciting for me because as you can tell I like to speak. Um, just so many experiences and so many things that I've done that I never would have. I mean, one key experience is the Vamps, if you don't know their boy band, coming to my school when I was in secondary school and singing to me in front of my entire school. So that was part of my Pride of Britain award. It is a story for another day and I am planning to do a video about that at some point. But so that was a pretty amazing experience. Um, but yeah, there's been so much and I think, you know, in part it's sort of, I don't want to say made up for so much of the pain and torment that we've gone through, but it's definitely helped us stay positive and helped us get through things because there's been so many amazing moments that we've had. There's so many good questions here, I'm having a really hard time picking. I have a lot of questions about immunosuppressants and like what they're like to take and are they a burden to your life. I would say absolutely not. Immunosuppressants for me have been something that is barely even worth the thought. I think it's such a small price to pay to take a pill every day or twice a day if you are able to live on because you've had an organ transplant. So for those of you who don't know, quickly, an immunosuppressant is a drug that you take that makes your immune system lower so that your immune system doesn't attack your transplanted organs. I've had many, many immunosuppressants. Some of them are better than others. At the moment, I'm on something called Serolimus, which is once a day, super easy. I get no side effects from it, apart from I don't heal very well, which is not great, but that's not really a massive thing. As I said, I just think it's like a price to pay and a very small price to pay for being given a second chance at life. So taking them for me is not an issue at all. And I don't think it really is to anyone that I know personally who's had a transplant. I.S underscore Jones asks, after coming this far in life, how do you see slash describe yourself as a person? 
I would describe myself as, what am I, annoying? <laughs> I think I'm annoying. I would describe myself as confident. I think I'm quite confident. I'd like to say tenacious. I think I'm quite tenacious. Uh, I'm determined. I like to get what I want. That is true. I like to get what I want. And I do usually get what I want, which I think is part of the reason that I'm still here. And I'd like to say I'm funny. I don't know, my friends might contest that, but I think I'm funny. <laughs> I love my own jokes. I don't know, I'd like to say kind. I care about other people. I'm quite superstitious, actually, which is sort of a thing that's come on over the last few years. Um, I'm always saying touch wood to myself and I'll go, blah, 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 touch wood. I'm doing that all the time. Yeah, that's how I describe myself. Annoying, <laughs> superstitious. Uh, tenacious, determined, and kind, and hilarious, obviously. <laughs> Fortunately, Jojo asks, what are your hopes for the future in your life specifically and in general? So my hopes for the future, I would like to have kids first and foremost, that is my life goal. Once I have had a child, my life will be complete. I would like to have many children. I would really like to have four kids. That's my life goal. Career-wise, I would like to be a journalist. I mean, I did journalism at uni. I want to be a broadcast journalist. I also love writing, so I love to have a job where I'm able to do both. I think I want my family to grow old and have a peaceful life. And in general, I think I just would love for organ donation to become a bigger subject and I want more people talking about it and I want more people doing it so that we can get more people transplanted so that everybody who needs a transplant can get one. I don't want people who are disabled to be treated like a minority anymore. I want equality for disability. That includes within representation on TV and stuff. Yeah, so. I also don't want Trump to be president anymore and I also don't want Boris Johnson to be Prime Minister anymore, so high hopes. <laughs> this is a really good question. I've said that about all of them because they're all good questions. I'm sorry if I'm saying your names wrong. I'm not very good at that kind of thing, which is probably not great as I want to be a journalist, but Annie Milena, I think, says, do you think that it is important to know where your organ came from to the person who donated it? I personally don't think that this is important. If you don't know, you are given no information about your donor because if you don't know, a person who receives a transplant is given very little information about their donor, out of respect really. Um, and I don't think it's important for a person to know. It was never important for me to know who they were or any details about them. I just always knew that they were very important in my life and that they were a very special person. I always hoped that I was doing my donor proud and I always hoped that they would have been pleased that someone like me received their heart. So I don't think it's important. My battery's flashing at me, so this is gonna cut out any second. How has your illness affected your dating life? From Denny Balqui. I'm so sorry about these names. My saying is that if a person doesn't want to date you because of your scars or because of your disability or because of your past, they are not worth being with. And I've stuck by that and I've always been very upfront. So first date, cards on the table, this is what's happened to me, I feel like you need to know. And it's worked out because I have a lovely boyfriend now and he knew everything from the very start and it didn't bother him at all. I think honesty is the best policy as long as you're upfront with somebody, then I don't see why it wouldn't work out and if they don't wanna be with you, they're not worth being with, you don't wanna be with them either. Remember that. This is a really simple question. Favourite book and favourite movie from I Am Draculala. <laughs> My favourite book is probably To Kill a Mockingbird. I absolutely love that book. I read it 
two or three times um, and I just think it's a wonderful story and a very important story as well. And my favourite movie is Interstellar. I love that film. It confuses many people. Um, it doesn't confuse me anymore because I've watched it about 20 times, but I absolutely love that film. Such a good film. Watch it. What is one thing you wish you could tell your younger self from Beth underscore Isles, I think it is, I-L-E-S? One thing I wish that I could tell my younger self is that if I could go back and talk to 10 year old Sissy, I'll show you 10 year old Sissy. This is 10 year old Cecilia. This is before the surgery, this is before any of the illnesses. I would tell her that it's going to be a long road, it's going to be a tough road, but plainly and simply you'll get through it and it will make you a better person and you will meet amazing people through it, you'll make amazing friends, you'll have amazing experiences and your family and your friends will always be there to love and support you. So it's going to be hard but don't worry because you will get through it and you'll always be supported by those you love and that's what's important. And that you're going to go to university and get a first class degree. We'll just do a couple more now because otherwise this video is going to be very long. Someone commented nice noses, like plural, I only have one nose. Maybe that was a comment about the fact that I look like I have two noses, I don't know. Another thing that many people have asked about is mental health struggles and whether I have ever experienced them. I have experienced struggles. I think for me they're much harder to talk about than my physical illnesses because I think I'm so used to talking about my physical illnesses and not so much the struggles that I've had mentally. I have had struggles mostly with anxiety and that's more recent and it's triggered by really random things um, and I think it's a little bit of I get memories that come back and old feelings and I don't like them so feelings from when I was poorly or feelings from when I was in secondary school when I didn't have the best time I didn't have loads of friends and it was quite a hard time for me that was another time that I really struggled I was very depressed um, in year 10 and 11 and then I moved to school and that just completely changed so it wasn't necessarily linked to my illnesses but it kind of was indirectly because I think I'd gone back to school to having nearly six months off having cancer treatment and I felt there wasn't really a place for me anymore in school even though I was at school with people who I'd grown up with and that's not their fault at all. I just think that people were moving on with their lives and they were getting on with everything and fair enough to them they didn't really have time for me to be ill anymore and so I felt very left out very isolated and I struggled a lot then and then I moved to school and that got so much better and then as I said more recently I had some anxiety and I am taking anxiety meds a low dose but sort of like a maintenance dose but that's much better now and uh that's it really I think it's just something that a lot of people go through and there's nothing wrong with it and you shouldn't be ashamed of talking about it. So yeah. I'm gonna scream. This video has taken me all day to film. My camera just ran out. Elbena, Eb, Eben, El Elbenale, El oh, I can't say it, I'm so sorry. It's Elbenoel. She said, what advice would you go to What advice would you give to people who are going through something similar? I would say to somebody going through health struggles, hang on in there first and foremost. I know that it seems like every news that you get is bad and that 
there's never going to be an end to it, there will. You will have a break, whether it be a long break, a short break, whether it be remission, whether it be a brand new treatment, whether it be painkillers that finally work, or anything like that. There will be a break, I promise you. I would say put your attention into something else. Get a hobby if you're able to, if you're well enough to and you have the energy. For example, when I was in hospital, I did loads of needle felting. Um, if you don't know what that is, look it up, but it's really fun and you can make really nice things. Um, binge watch your favorite TV show over and over again. Read, uh, just do anything that takes your mind away from what's going on. Make sure that you're talking about other things and you're thinking about other things and that those around you are doing the same. And if you can, just bring a little bit of normality back into your life and it will make you feel better. Maybe if you're able to, again, get up, get dressed and walk around your garden or walk around your street and or dress up for dinner or something and it will make you feel so much better. And I understand that not everybody's able to do that. So my main piece of advice would just be don't worry yourself into further illness. Things will get better, you will get a break eventually, I promise. Just hang on in there. Okay, that's it. Those are all the questions that I'm going to answer because otherwise we could be here all night. I just want to say thank you to everyone who sent in questions. I really enjoy answering them. I've always wanted to do a Q&A video and I finally got to do it. Thank you to Behind the Scars for having me. I absolutely loved my weekend. I had the best time taking over the account. Uh, for anybody who wants to check it out, it will be in the description. Make sure you go and like my picture and watch my stories, which are saved. And go and show everyone else some love and go and show Sophie some love for her amazing project. And finally, welcome to all my new subscribers. We have finally reached over 100 subscribers and we're nearly at 150, which is very exciting. You know, small, small victories. But anyway, I'll see you next time. Bye! This is taking me so long to film. It's finally a while. Bye! I'm begging you.